both sides of the equation. And one of the biggest challenges I think that we all have, and, and there's no perfect formula, is how do we remain true to our values and our principles while recognizing that in democracies, in pluralistic societies, that the only way we are going to be able to get things done is if we agree to a certain set of rules, and part of those rules are that you never get 100% of what you want because somebody else is going to have a slightly different set of interests or a slightly different set of values. And that navigating that territory in which you push for what you believe in, but at a certain point you are willing to say, okay, let me take this now and then build on this later. That's necessary for everyone. I mean, look, when I passed the Paris, or when I helped uh, get the Paris Agreement on climate accomplished, I was the first one to say what we've done here is not adequate to meet the demands of climate science. The, the, uh, the measures that had been set, the targets that had been set by each country, even if they all met them, wouldn't be sufficient to address the pace at which temperatures were rising and emissions were going into the atmosphere. But if I had held out for us getting to where we needed to be in the science, we wouldn't have gotten the accord. And my theory was, look, if for the first time I can get every country on Earth, or at least I think at that time there were maybe one or two countries that didn't sign up, now it turns out it's only mine, um, <laughs> but that's a whole other question. Um, if, if we can establish that principle that everybody has to address this problem and everybody has to take steps to do something about it, and that becomes a, a, the architecture that's in place and it is measurable and people are accountable, if I can get that in place then, I'll be able to turn up those standards each and every year as the science and the technology and what's possible develops, and we build, right? Um, in, in my own country, in the United States, uh, our, our pension system, what we call Social Security, when it was first passed, didn't apply to everybody. Here's an interesting example. It did not apply to domestic workers. Why do you think that is? Who were domestics? Huh? Immigrants. Many of them were black people. They, yeah, they were, I guess, immigrants brought a little while way back. There was a whole different, different way of how they came over. So, so the, 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 the South, the Southern politicians, they wanted to exclude, as a part of reinforcing uh, racial discrimination and segregation laws in the South, they wanted to exclude certain portions of it. Now, you could argue that Franklin Roosevelt should have said, well, I'm not willing to pass this unless I can get those workers. Or you can say, you get that set up, given those particular political constraints at that time, and then over time, those biases were eliminated. How we think about those compromises is something that each of us have to take responsibility for. We can't, as I said, there's no formula. There may be certain issues in which we say to ourselves, no, I'm sorry, I can't, this, on this I cannot compromise. Right? And each of us may have certain issues like that. 
I'd like to think that if there was a proposal that today said we can you know, uh, pass a, a wonderful uh, law that is going to reduce poverty, but this particular group of people is excluded from it. I'd like to say, uh, today, knowing what we now know, the, the basis of our society today, I actually think I'd have to say, no, I'm sorry, we can't pass that. Because that violates now a principle that we've established. We've set a higher threshold. We're not going to go backwards on that. And so I, no matter how wonderful this new social program might be, I'm not going to abide by that. Um, on the other hand, I know from experience in passing the health care law that I had to work on in the United States uh, that that was not the ideal health care program that I wanted to set up. It's what I could get at the time, and if I could establish the principle that everybody gets health care and get 20 million people more health care, even if 10 million still hadn't gotten it, that's what I'm going to do now. And then I'll fight some more later for the other 20%. So to go back to the point that was made by Conleth, what's true for me when I was a president or an elected official, it's going to be true for you as well, even within your own organizations. And one of the things I do worry about sometimes uh, among progressives in the United States, maybe it's true here as well, um, is a certain kind of rigidity where we say, ah, I'm sorry, this is how it's going to be, and then we start sometimes creating what's called a uh, circular firing squad where you start shooting at your allies because one of them is straying from purity on the issues, uh, and when that happens, typically the overall effort and movement weakens. So uh, I think whether you are speaking as a citizen or as a you know, political leader or as an organizer, whether you're in the nonprofit space or in civic space or you're in the political arena, you have to recognize that the way we've structured democracy requires you to take into account people who don't agree with you. And that, by definition, means you're not going to get 100% of what you want. But you should take some time to think in your own mind and continually refine and reflect, what are my core principles? Because the danger is if you don't know what your principles are, that's when you compromise your principles away. <laughs>